Our newscast tonight. After landing an attentive ear to Senri leaders, President Park emphasized the need for the two sides to jointly tackle reform tasks at hand. Also, she may hold a trilateral meeting involving the NPAD next. Despite strong opposition from within the country and plummeting approval ratings, Shinzo Abe may get what he has been pushing for, a bigger role for Japan's self-defense forces. The historic Iran nuclear deal means Korean firms can resume their business in the oil-rich country, and though some feel it could give some kind of momentum to North Korea's denuclearization, that will involve a lot of time and discussions between Washington, Seoul, and Pyongyang. For these stories and more, stay with us. Hello and welcome to Primetime News on this Thursday, July 16th. I'm Daniel Che. And I'm Hong Jie. Thank you for tuning in. Let's start with our first story. President Park Geun-hye met with the ruling Hindu Party leaders today, urging lawmakers to join government efforts to revive the economy. The meeting was held under in a positive atmosphere, not seen in weeks after the president vetoed disputed revisions to the National Assembly law. Our Che Yusan starts us off. Congratulating the ruling Senuri Party's new floor leadership, President Park Geun-hye said her office, the government and the ruling party must unite to tackle a number of reform tasks at hand. She also urged the party's new leadership to put the public interest first. While pledging its full support for the president, the party said it would do its best to pass a bill for a supplementary budget through parliament during the current session. The budget aims to help people affected by the MERS outbreak and a recent drought. The ruling party also said it will resume dialogue with the presidential office and the government soon. We reaffirmed that we can only gain the public's trust when we communicate and unite in moving in the right direction. The communication channel was severed for several weeks amid controversy over revisions to the National Assembly law that would have given the parliament the power to request changes to ordinances. Concerned about the bill's unconstitutionality, President Bak vetoed it, slamming former floor leader Yoo Seung-min for engaging in politics for his own personal interest. Meanwhile, the party asked the president to pardon some of the country's business leaders around the time of Korea's Liberation Day next month. The party cited a need to encourage corporate investment to revitalize the economy. In a display of faith, President Park held a separate one-on-one -on -one meeting with party leader Kim Musong. While the presidential office and the ruling party managed to patch things up, a tripartite meeting with the opposition party leader may also resume after the president agreed to consider that prospect. Choi Yusan, Arirang News. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe inches closer to achieving his goal of boosting the country's military role. Japan's lower house has approved a set of security bills despite growing public opposition. Kim Jian fills us in. Japan's lower house of parliament has approved new legislation that could allow Japanese troops to fight abroad for the first time since World War II. The package of 11 security bills would enable the Japanese military to aid an ally under attack. The security situation surrounding Japan is becoming increasingly challenging. With this in mind, it is an absolutely necessary legislation to protect the lives of the Japanese and also to prevent the country from going to war. The legislation will now be put up for a vote in the upper house, which has 60 days to approve it. If no action is taken, the lower house can push the bill through with another vote to make them into law by September 27th, when the current parliamentary session ends. Supporters of the bill argue a bolder stance is essential to meeting new security challenges, including a rising China. The bill's passage comes amid mass protests in Japan and a dent in Prime Minister Shinzo Abe's approval rate.
ratings. Organizers in Japan say an estimated 60,000 protesters rallied against the legislation, fearing the country will be dragged into U.S.-led conflicts around the world. Demonstrators say the revisions could violate Article 9 of the country's pacifist constitution, drafted after Japan's defeat in World War II. The development is of particular concern to Korea and China, who both say Tokyo hasn't shown any genuine remorse for Japan's imperialistic aggressions during wartime. Meanwhile, Abe's disapproval ratings in Japan rose 5 points to 42 percent in an Asai Shinbun poll released earlier this week. Kim Jeong. Arirang News. Now, the two Koreas just finished the fourth round of talks to resolve a series of issues at the inter-Korean Kaesong Industrial Complex. A unification ministry official said today a long-standing wage hike dispute is at the forefront of discussions, along with ways to improve working conditions and customs procedures. These are the first government-level talks between the two Koreas since June last year. In February, Pyongyang unilaterally raised the minimum monthly wage for North Korean workers by around 5 percent to $74. Seoul rejected the move, calling it a breach of a 2004 agreement stipulating the two sides set wages together. In late May, the North accepted the South's tentative offer to pay wages at the current level of a little over $70, buying the two sides some time to resolve the issue. The groundbreaking Iran nuclear deal is set to have some ripple effects for sure, but would it positively alter North Korea's attitude towards denuclearization? Our Connie Kim reports on the prospects for the regime's nuclear weapons program. Experts say Iran and North Korea are in different stages of nuclear weapons development. North Korea has carried out three nuclear tests and has the ability to produce highly enriched uranium. Iran, on the other hand, possesses low enriched uranium and is in the early stages of nuclear weapons development. In a capitalist country like Iran, the economic sanctions on the country may have played a big role in its decision to curb its nuclear weapons program. While in Pyongyang's case, sanctions against the regime have had little effect on its reclusive economic system. North Korea shows no signs of coming back to the negotiating table after it walked away from the six-party denuclearization talks in 2008. What's even more concerning is that the regime claims it has the capability to miniaturize warheads small enough to load onto ballistic missiles. To bring about progress in the long-stalled multilateral talks, the consensus seems to be that inter-Korean talks are the first step. Experts in Seoul say improvements in inter-Korean ties are critical in laying the groundwork for a breakthrough in North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Showing flexibility in inter-Korean relations by providing humanitarian aid or starting exchanges between the two countries could open up the doors for talks. Experts also note, however, the importance of a summit between Seoul and Washington scheduled for later this year. The last time the two leaders met, they say the pressure on Pyongyang to denuclearize increased, which in turn led to a deterioration in relations with the regime. Connie Kim, Arirang News. A long road ahead, but certainly hope springs eternal. One thing for sure is that with the historic deal, Korean companies' business in Iran will pick up soon. For more on the potential impact of the agreement on the local economy, here's our Shin Semin. Korean firms are gearing up to resume their business in the oil-rich country now that the Iran nuclear deal has passed their first hurdle. Data by the Korea International Trade Association shows that trade volume between the two countries peaked in 2011, but fell after stifling economic sanctions were imposed in 2012. The biggest beneficiaries in Korea are expected to be in the shipbuilding, petrochemical and construction sectors. And Korean builders are hoping to be the biggest winners as Iran was their fourth largest offshore market before the sanctions were set. With the normalization of the economy there, Korean firms could construct a $43 billion market, thanks to the good reputation they've built. Auto parts, home appliances and cosmetics are also promising export items. Korean products took up nearly 70 percent of the Iranian home appliance market last year, thanks to a lifting of sanctions on some consumer products. 
The Iranian government fostered domestic industries like automobiles, which eventually boosted Korean exports of auto parts and steel plates. Iran, which has the world's fourth largest oil reserves, is expected to gradually ramp up production, pushing down global oil prices and eventually helping shipping companies save on costs. But experts say companies shouldn't get too excited just yet. Currently, the trade volume between the two is less than 1 percent of Korea's total trade. So prospective companies should seek to enter industries other Korean firms haven't yet explored. The government has vowed to support Korean firms by setting up a help center and keeping close tabs on the market as the competition for contracts and lingering economic uncertainties could put local companies at a disadvantage. Shin Se-min, Arirang News. Let's shift gears now. The Asian Development Bank has slashed its growth forecast for Korea. According to an ADB report, the Korean economy is expected to grow 3 percent this year. That's down from its previous outlook of 3.5 percent. The bank also revised down its projection for next year to 3.5 percent. The report added slower than expected growth in China and the U.S. will have a negative impact on Korea, an export-driven country. Korea's exports have slumped for six straight months through June this year. The Korean government is working to officially declare an end to the MERS outbreak as early as next month. The head of the Central MERS Task Force, Kwon Dr. Tar, said today the government is reviewing details of the announcement. He said Korea will most likely make the declaration on August 2nd, which is 28 days or twice the incubation period of the virus after the last infected patient was reported in the country. The government's time frame follows a separate standard from that of the World Health Organization, which recommends the 28-day countdown to begin after the recovery of the last infected patient. The U.S. State Department has given the green light to the Korean military to make purchases that will help upgrade its aging fleet of fighter jets. But the move is raising some eyebrows as the approved amount is far above Korea's initial budget. Na Young-kyung has the details. The U.S. has approved a possible sale of parts, equipment and logistical support to Korea. If approved by Congress, the deal will allow Korea to upgrade its aging fleet of 134 KF-16 fighter jets. Citing military sources in Washington, Seoul-based Yonam News says the price set by the U.S. State Department is $2.5 billion. But that's a billion dollars more than a now-scrapped contract Seoul had with British defense firm BAE Systems. Since December 2014, the Korean government has worked to switch the principal contractor, saying it cannot afford to pay the combined $700 million extra the U.S. and BAE are asking for. Observers are now raising questions about the reasons behind the move, especially if the current deal with Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman is going to cost a lot more. In response, the spokesman for Korea's Defense Acquisition Program Administration stressed to reporters on Thursday that the $2.5 billion price is the maximum cap drawn up by the U.S. and not the final amount. He then assured that Korea will not have to spend more than what it had originally set aside to upgrade the KF-16s, which, with the improvements, will better support and maintain the critical airspace over the Korean peninsula. Na hyun Arirang News. Two sectors at the heart of Korea's economy were having a rough time due to sluggish conditions at home and abroad. To show its solidarity with shipbuilding and auto industries, Korea's trade minister visited the nation's biggest shipyard and automobile plant on Wednesday, hoping for better results in the second half of the year. Kwon Soa reports from Ulsan. They are Korea's biggest automaker and the world's largest shipbuilder. Hyundai Motor Company and Hyundai Heavy Industries, both of the headquarters situated in the southeastern city of Ulsan. Along with electronics and steel, they embody Korea's growth engines. But with the negative growth in outbound shipments throughout the first half of the year, there are growing concerns that Korea's key export sectors are somewhat shaky, especially the shipbuilding industry. 
Korea's Trade Minister Yoon Sang-jik met with executives at the shipyard and encouraged them by emphasizing that Korea is still in the lead in the shipbuilding sector ahead of China and Japan. However, Korea's ship exports plunged more than 19 percent in June on year. Hyundai Heavy Industry saw a net loss of 1.9 billion U.S. dollars in 2014, while it saw a net profit of around 130 million dollars the year before. 2.8 billion dollars of operating losses were posted last year. The picture is not looking promising in the automobile industry either. According to an anonymous source, Hyundai Motor and its affiliate Kia Motors lowered their sales target for this year by around 10 percent. And seems like this slowing trend will continue for the time being, as forecasts for ship and car exports in the second half of the year is already expected to be gloomy. Despite this, the trade minister said that no efforts should be spared to overcome this situation. It has never been easy. There have always been difficult times, but we have to overcome them. I came here to encourage you that producing one more car and exporting it always counts. Yoon asked for more cooperation of the private sectors to work along with the latest export promotion plan unveiled last week, which includes a governmental spending of 100 billion U.S. dollars to boost exports in the latter half of the year. Kwon Soa, Arirang News, Ulsan. And for today's top headlines, international headlines, that is, we are now joined by Isa Noe at the News Center. Our focus today, Eurozone finance ministers agree to provide Greece with emergency loans. A FIFA official is extradited to the U.S. And NASA's spacecraft returns mesmerizing new images of Pluto. I like the two stories better, but we'll start with the first story, Isa Noe. Let's start over in Greece. Well, guys, it's official. The finance ministers have formally agreed to lend bridging loans to the debt-ridden country, while the European Central Bank, well, they say they'll keep their interest rates unchanged. Now, this all comes as the Greek parliament voted yes to tough austerity measures in exchange for the bailout package, in the midst of party opposition and heated protests. Our Han Daun reports. Two hundred twenty nine lawmakers voted yes, sixty four voted no, and six abstained. Therefore, the bill was passed by majority. The Greek parliament gave the green light to harsh austerity measures early Thursday local time, opening the doors for talks with its Eurozone partners to secure a new bailout package of up to 86 billion euros. The measures passed include tax hikes and an increase in the retirement age. Prior to the vote, Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras made a passionate appeal to Parliament, saying there was no other choice to avert economic collapse. I will admit that the measures we are tabling are harsh, and I don't agree with them. I don't believe they will help the Greek economy, and I say so openly. But I also say that I must implement them. That is our difference. But he failed to convince the hardline members of his own party, as half of the no votes came from the ruling Syriza party. Deputy Finance Minister and Syriza member Nadia Valavani resigned in protest. Ahead of the vote, thousands of Greek citizens took to the streets in Athens to protest the measures. Police responded with tear gas as the demonstration turned violent. Unions and trade associations representing public workers went on a 24-hour strike. And then, Arirang News. Swiss authorities have extradited an official to the U.S. who was arrested for an investigation into a major FIFA corruption scandal. Jeffrey Webb, a former FIFA vice president, is now the first out of seven officials to be sent to the U.S. on account of corruption. A Swiss justice personnel said that Webb was given over to the U.S. Poli uh, police in Zurich, who escorted him on his journey to New York, adding that he didn't fight the extradition. He is accused of accepting bribes amounting to millions of dollars related to the sale of marketing rights and is expected to face trial soon. Webb is currently banned from his duties at FIFA and CONCACAF, as well as other football associations. 
Further allegations that are being investigated into FIFA include bribery, fraud, and money laundering, as well as corruption during the bidding processes for the 2018 and 2022 World Cups. The charges have dealt a severe blow to the image of the world's football governing body, with even its president announcing his resignation last month. Unlike Webb, the remaining six of the detained officials are fighting their extraditions. And turning to space exploration, NASA has unveiled stunning, never-before-seen images of Pluto. Taken from the New Horizons spacecraft, astounding scientists as to how young and dynamic the dwarf planet really is. Our Song Jung-in reports. NASA has unveiled new close-up and crystal clear photos of Pluto less than 24 hours after the agency confirmed its New Horizons spacecraft successfully completed its flyby of the dwarf planet on the edge of our solar system. Today, the New Horizons team is bringing what was previously a blurred point of light into focus. The first high-resolution image that covers less than 1% of Pluto's surface shows a dynamic landscape, including mountains estimated to be 3.5 kilometers high. The close-up image doesn't show any visible impact craters, leading scientists to believe the surface is around 100 million years old, very young relative to the rest of the solar system, which was formed about 4.5 billion years ago. The photo also suggests Pluto is geologically active and is being sculpted not by outside forces but by internal heat. But the more surprising discovery is that the mountains are thought to be composed of frozen water instead of rock as previously assumed. And we see water ice on Pluto for the first time. We, we can be very sure that the water is there in great abundance. New Horizons also sent a new image of Charon, Pluto's largest moon, and a low-resolution image of Hydra, one of its small moons. NASA says it will spend the next 16 months analyzing the thousands of images that New Horizons will be transmitting back to Earth and releasing both images and scientific observations along the way. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. And seeing those images just shows how mankind can still reach new heights and beyond. And that does it for your international news for this hour. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Typhoon Nanka has reached Japan's Kagoshima Prefecture and is making its way to the northwestern part of the country and possibly will have indirect effects to the eastern parts of the Korean Peninsula by tomorrow. So the Korea Meteorological Administration has already issued advisories for port cities and islands across the southeastern coastal areas as they'll be hit by strong winds and high waves through Saturday. So those near these regions, please take the necessary precautions. And tomorrow's weather outlook for the rest of the country is looking a tad cooler and cloudier than today, with highs hovering in the upper 20s. But in the meantime, the regions in the east will have much cooler conditions on Friday under a mix of rain and cloudy skies. On that note, let's take a closer look at the readings for tomorrow. Seoul and Daegu will peak at 29 and 28, and Gwangju and Busan will rise to 29 and 25. And as for the other regions, it seems like Daejeon and Jeju Island will see a high of 28 and 27, while Dokdo rises to 21. Well, that's all for the weather. Good night. That brings us to the end of our newscast. Thank you for staying with us. We'll be back with more same time tomorrow. Goodbye for now.